So yeah, our talk is uh, dynamic global illumination from many lights. Um, I just want to start shortly by introducing Confetti. It's only one slide. Uh, what we do, um, we consider ourselves a think tank for game and movie related industries. We have middleware for game developers. Uh, so we have a dynamic global illumination system, which we will talk about today. Uh, we have a post effects pipeline and also a dynamic stratum system. If you come to GDC, to our booth, uh, you will see demos uh, running of all those systems. We also provide consulting and programming services. Uh, our biggest clients are Intel and Qualcomm. Uh, we also do, we are engine tuners for many game developers. So in general, we, we provide software solutions for games, movies, and tools for GPU manufacturers, which means we actually have more uh, software than uh, the three middleware packages. We have a couple of more middleware packages that we don't license. Um, our website is www.confifex.com. Uh, if you license any of our packages, it comes with full source code. Okay, let's talk about the motivation for dynamic global animation. So what we're going to show today is uh, a dynamic GI system that works on static and dynamic objects like animated characters. It does not require any preprocessed data. Um, and this was especially important for us. Um, when I worked for Rockstar, uh, the open world, uh, open world games usually don't work really well with preprocessed data, so you want to generate everything on the fly. Uh, and then you might also have problems if you want to destruct something. Um, it's easier to do a 24-hour cycle if the sun is constantly moving in your game. Well, just think of Red Dead Redemption and GTA 4. And the artist iteration time is shorter when you can do everything in real time. Our system works on a large number of lights. Um, we have never tested how many, um, but the but I think the demo has about 120 in some scene. You will see that. I'll, I'll show a screenshot with debug. I'll put, and you can see how many lights and shadows and uh, lights who actually cast uh, GI are there. Uh, we have uh, a light, we, our approach is based on light propagation volumes. So um, one of the things uh, we did uh, was that we are capable to do those volume calculations on the GPU or CPU. Uh, last year we were targeting on GDC uh, Sandy Bridge, and uh, this this demo actually targets Ivy Bridge, and it's very useful in those machines uh, when you can move all the volume calculations over to the CPU. Um, we, we did tests and, and it works astonishingly well. So let's look at a couple of screenshots. So this is a typical sponsor scene um, where we have a demo or a movie of a demo later uh, where you can see sponsor. Uh, currently we try to set up a sponsor scene that has more colorful stuff in there so that you can see uh, better the color bouncing around. Um, to prove that our system actually can bounce off characters, we kind of like simulated a scene where it bounces off the floor and then onto a character. So that was one of our simple test cases that we started with. Um, this is another shot where we actually show the difference between uh, GI on and off. So on the left side it's off and on the right side it's on. Um, you can especially see the difference in the shadows. So when you look at the at the lower row, and you look at the shadows in the background, you can see how the shadows actually get color from the GI system. Here's a shot with a similar shot with uh, textures. So this is without, and this is with. So I'll just do this again. This is with GI, and then this is without. And you can see that, uh, especially in the background, the color get the the shadow gets color, and and overall it looks a lot more natural. Uh, here we have a shot of the environment. That's an older shot. So this is without GI. And then. I'm just waiting until I see that the whole audience can see it. It takes a while. And then this one is with, with GI. 
Uh, here's another one. Uh, we'll talk about this debug menu in a second. So this is with GI. And then this one is without GI. Uh, here's one of my favorite shots. So this is without GI. And you can actually see how the light bounces off of the opponent. So the opponent wears a red, uh, a red uniform. And uh, you can see the red color bouncing off of him when I switch on GI. And this is without. Here's the last shot. Uh, so what you see on the left here is our uh, debug menu. And um, th there's a lot of information for us in there. But um, for this particular scene, and this is only the light, lights only, lights and shadows only, we have one character. And we currently have about 13 character shadows going. Um, well, there are also 40, 51 particles with eight emitters. Um, you can see that 25 lights are diffuse lights, so they are diffuse only. Then we have 68 lights that are diffuse and specular. Um, then we have currently 34 shadows in view. And we currently fill up seven shadow maps. Of all those lights, 34 lights have uh, a GI fact attached to them. And we only update in the moment six uh, reflective shadow maps. But we inject actually 46 lights into the volume. OK, now we can go to the demo movies. If you go to our website, there are three movies at the bottom of the page. I'll just do that. So let's see. Yeah, here. So, so this one on the left, uh, this is the one with textures, colors, everything. Then the one in the middle is lights only, lights and shadows only. And then on the right, we have a demo of uh, the sponsor model uh, running. Uh, so the, the sponsor model just shows one directional light, while the two demos on the left show Lots of point lights. So I can just run one of them. So we have a, a couple of other techniques in there as well. Uh, they were also in last year's rock. Where's your team spirit? I think it's funny how these idiots think they stand a chance against us. You should have seen our boy in action. I there are some depth of field, post effects. Uh, this is rock the robot. And you can see the shadows and light dancing on her face. So there were a couple of people involved in making that demo. There's credit at the end, credit list. OK, so that was the one with textures and everything. Now comes the one who only shows the light and um, shadow view. And I also have the debug preview switched on so that you can see how the number of lights and shadows and lights that actually change GI 
um, or have GI change over time. I think it's funny how these idiots think they stand a chance against us. They should have taken our war in action. I mean, this guy is unstoppable. He's not too many of that kind. Snaps up the next one. Flies down the vacuum corridor. Slams into the back. So there, was, there were also a couple of point lights coming from particles. So the point lights were attached to particles that were flying around. And uh, that's the credit screen. And then uh, we have a short demo just showing it off uh, running in Sponsor. And um, so that's just with one directional light. Okay, so those were the demos. You can see all those demos running in real time at our booth. If you if you come by and you can also play around with them, just taking the mouse, moving around. So let's start a little bit about. Uh, let's start with our actual talk. Um, following the data flow, we started the talk in mostly three phases. Uh, first of all, we capture the light data and cube reflect to shadow maps. Then we have the light propagation volume stage. Um, and then we apply the lights from the volume again. Um, Igor will take over starting at the light propagation volume stage, and I will do the first uh, part with the cube reflective shadow maps. So how do we capture light data? Um, reflective shadow maps are something that are around for a long time. Carsten Daxbacher um, started or published a lot of uh, papers on this. You can find um, articles in Shader X and uh, everywhere uh, about already, I think, five, six, seven years ago. Um, and uh, we just use, we, we nearly use the technique as it was initially developed. We have a s couple of small little uh, changes. The, the main change is that it's not a 2D map. Uh, but it's a cube map in our case, uh, so that we can actually capture uh, the data for point lights. What we store in the cube reflective shadow maps is depth, normal, and then color data for the light color and the albedo. So this data, similar to the original uh, approach reflective shadow maps, represents a light source. So each pixel, each texel represents a light source. So similar to um, wait a second, similar to the regular uh, reflective shadow maps, um, we capture oh there's a there's a link we capture those light data in into uh, cube reflective shadow maps. One of the differences is that the projection and the rendering is actually a little bit different, and that has to do with the nature of uh, cube reflective shadow maps. So one of the things that are different is that um, the flux amount for SOFL depends only on the solid angle, not the SOFL orientation or the distance. Uh, so what this means is that the same amount of photons, uh, those are the red dotted lines, pass through SOFL A and SOFL B. Um, that was kind of like a challenge. Another challenge was that at some point we have to stop capturing data, and so we had to come up with a fall-off function. Um, so with increasing distance, the circles can be really become really big, and then they might be bigger than our light propagation volume cell or volume cell. 
So we cut off actually with a simple uh, smooth step function here um, to prevent from this from happening. Another challenge uh, coming from the cube map is that the solid angle is not really uniform across the reflective shadow map. Uh, for now, we decided to ignore this. So we don't have really a solution for that. One of the things that um, became over became really intriguing over time uh, was the idea of caching cube reflective shadow maps. So um, when you remember the debug menu, there was one point where it said how many reflective shadow maps are actually updated. And so this debug menu tells you um, how tells you which which are static and which are currently dynamic. For um, so we we differ between static and dynamic cube uh, reflective shadow maps, and we differ between them in a way that everything that moves gets the dynamic uh, cube reflective shadow map, and everything that is uh, static uh, can stay in a static map. So that was especially developed for dynamic character, dynamic characters. So here's an example of what might happen here. The, the main reason why I actually have to move up and down my PowerPoint slide is that um, the webinar window blocks <laughs> a lot of the data here. And I can only see a small amount of my slides. So um, consider this uh, scene. You have a blue cell, a blue cubic cell, just uh, moving to the left. You have a red static wall, which is this red line here. And then you have a light. And behind that, you see actually this, a single stack of, uh, a single layer of uh, the volumes. So what's going to happen is that um, when this blue box moves in, into these white rays, and they represent a single pixel in the cubic reflective shadow map. There will be some popping happening because the blue box um, that represents a dynamic object will occlude the background, but this will happen rather quick. So there's a flux change in the grid. And uh, so what we did is we increased um, to make up for this, we increased the resolution of the cubic reflective shadow map in those cases. So those are our dynamic cases. And this way, the flux change is actually smaller, and the popping is not so much visible. So in essence, what we have is uh, we have a variable cube reflective shadow map resolution that we can actually change on the fly. So for more moving objects, we have a size of 16 by 16 on each cube face. So six faces, each 16 by 16. Overall, this comes down to 15 kilobyte per light. And if you, if you want to cache 100 lights, it's 1.5 megabyte. It's possible that the GPU allocates a little bit more memory, because 15 kilobytes is rather small. For moving objects, we switch to a bigger cubic reflective shadow map. Uh, we use actually 64 by 64 on each cube face. And so we have overall uh, in memory 240 kilobytes. So if you have 10 of them, uh, you have 2.4 megabytes, roughly. The static uh, data is cached, and uh, we have certain heuristics to actually track if we keep it cached. Um, very simplified, we just look if a dynamic object, object comes close, and then we switch from the static to the dynamic CRSM, which means we also increase the quality, and uh, start updating that. So that was my part of the talk. Uh, from here on, uh, Igor will take over with uh, the light injection into the light propagation volumes. OK, 
Okay, hello. It took me some time to, to switch. Now I'm ready. Nice to meet you all on our panel. Uh, okay, so to this point, we already have got a captured reflective shadow maps. So what should we do with it? Now further steps. So now we are going to capture uh, the initial distribution of light. Uh, so what we do with our uh, our SAM, we treat it as um, an array of virtual point lights. So each of them has the position, their direction, and obviously the color, which is um, which could be treated as a as a fox. So. Uh, what we do, we uh, calculate the flux based on this data, then we compress it. Uh, we repre represent the light flow as uh, two bands of uh, spherical harmonics uh, approximation. And we calculate separately coefficients for a red, green, and blue component. The, uh, effectively allowing uh, color bleeding. Uh, spherical harmonics uh, approximation allow, allow us to, uh, to, to store uh, the direction just the distribution actually. And we finally write it into three volume textures. So each one uh, each one represented a single channel, blue, green or red. Uh, there are uh, some challenge challenges actually. Uh, two bands is not that much, so we actually uh, we are able to s to store uh, not that many different directions. But assuming that the uh, reflected light has a pretty low frequency, two bands is enough. So flux distribution is actually uh, mm, repre uh, represent uh, the numbered model. So we assume that the flux distributed is distributed as a cosine law. So we use a well-known mm, spherical harmonics approximation for it. Uh, this slope is obviously uh, centered around normal. For each, uh, for each given taxon of the Sarah Sam. Uh, okay, okay. There is one more note. Uh, although, uh, although the amount of flux doesn't uh, doesn't rely on the orientation of the of the surface, we still have to uh, we still have to filter the uh, surfaces, which are oriented. Uh, from the light, so that they don't receive any flux at all. So we still use and to tell to detect those taxons. Uh, another another thing we've mentioned that um, since uh, since our surfaces are injected into the, into the single single cell of the uh, whole volume, it is possible it is possible that the uh, that the pixel would light itself. So, uh, in order to avoid some lighting, we try to offset uh, offset the position of the uh, injection of the surface. What we do, we uh, we use the most simple approach, but it appeared to be pretty effective for us. We just offset the position of the injection of the surface uh, by the half size of the. Uh, our PV cell, in, and we use uh, the direction, we, we use the normal as the direction of the offset. Um, uh, in, order to, in order to cover um, the, as much as we can with our light propagation volume on the one hand, and to uh, still to have a pretty high detail lighting, we used a pretty well-known approach 
uh, we use cascades. There are three uh, cascades for um, there are three, three cascades used. They are situated generally in front of the camera, similar to cascaded shadow maps, and all of them all of them uh, have to cover the camera position. This is the difference, the action difference. And uh, as the result, only the lights which are pretty close to the camera actually have to uh, be injected. So only for those lights uh, we generate and we cache of the uh, uh, reflected shadow maps. Of course, in the worst case, uh, the light should be injected into all cascades but it's not usually uh, true for all lights. So basically we have a kind of uh, save um, on the lights which go on only into the, um, into the biggest uh, propagation volume. So here is the illustration. So assuming that the camera is situated in this cell, we still have some cells behind, behind the camera. This is, this is used to allow uh, light uh, being reflected by the surfaces behind the camera still to influence, uh, to influence the cells which are situated in front of the camera. So the light is being propagated from this cell to, to those cells and it is visible, it is still visible. Uh, so, uh, objects both the dynamic and static, they're injected into every cascade. Uh, of course, it is tempting to filter some objects and uh, to claim that uh, we obey the uh, light and energy conserving rules, but uh, this won't work. Small, small cascades, they have greater influence on the final picture and they can capture finer details of our Earth's uh, reflected shadow map. Additionally, um, if there is a small occluder, such as a door or window, which blocks the light from coming into the room, if we filter the, this occluder and if we don't use it, we'll have false, uh, false light in, in the room or in some closed area, which will obviously look odd. However, sometimes, sometimes if each cascade has its own RSM, which is true for uh, directional lights, for big directional lights such as the sun, we can still, we can still filter out small objects for the low resolution maps. For example, if the object uh, occupies only a fraction of the uh, a fraction of the reflected shadow map uh, surfing. So doing, doing so, we, um, we try to filter high frequency noise, which will uh, otherwise occur. Okay, so how does it work for different pipelines, the X9 and the X10 plus? From the very beginning, we have uh, our RSM, which is, uh, which represents several uh, Virtual, po virtual point lights. For each virtual point light, for each uh, pixel of the reflected shadow map, we generate a point. In DX9, uh, we simply uh, send us increasing integers to a very shader, while in DX10, we just use a uh, system, uh, system value for this. Okay, so those uh, those very vertices go to a vert shader where we calculate their certain position. We also calculate uh, other attributes which go further. Uh, the main difference is that uh, in DX10 we also um, use geometry shader so that this uh, allows us to address a uh, separate slices in the 3D texture. Uh, then those uh, 
points being emitted by vertex or vertex and geometry shader, they go to rasterizer and later they get into pixel shader and raster operation unit. So the worst thing about this is that uh, only a single pixel, single pixel of the whole quad will be used. Effectively uh, reducing the um, power of our GPU by a factor of four. So what we do, what we try to do at this point is to move all computations to Verox shader where the full, uh, the full GPU will be involved. Now in pixel shader just pass data to raster operation units so that uh, we won't use too much cycles. Uh, the second uh, actually, the, the most, the biggest difference between DX9 and DX10 approach is that in DX9 9 we can't address uh, slicing of 3D texture, so we unwrap, unwrap each slice uh, on the two-dimensional texture, which leads us to the following. Later, when we are applying, uh, when we are applying the uh, our propagation volume. In DX9, we have to uh, sample twice to emulate fully concentration. While in DX10, we, uh, we've got this for free. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about the uh, actual propagation, which actually um, gets the full, um, the full grip populated with the data which will be applied later. Uh, energy is propagated to the six neighbors among the excellent directions. We could use uh, more directions, so we could use uh, diagonal directions too, but um, tests show that this don't add uh, on too much details, but this is much more expensive. Uh, I also want to know that all subsequent propagation steps, uh, they uh, they take the previous iteration as an input. So this uh, well, this requires us to use additional steps to blend the uh, the result of the propagation steps together at the end. So in each, initially, each cell contains only the primary primary uh, primary reflection uh, reflected light from the uh, from the actual geometry. Uh, this initial flow is propagated to the neighbor cells. We actually use two approaches. Uh, the uh, approach uh, which is described is it has a uh, high quality but also it takes more, uh, occupies more GPU cycles. So what we do, we uh, converge the flux flow uh, for the first order approximation of the phase visibility function. So we effectively do the integration between the uh, intensity, intensity of our light flow and the visibility function. The result uh, of this integration is obviously a scanner which modulates uh, exactly the same visibility function and um, this appears to be a pretty good approximation. We obviously do uh, get three scanners for each of the car channels separately. However, however, our implementation is a bit different from the theory. Instead of doing uh, propagation from the cell, we do propagation to the cell. So instead of uh, scattering, we do data gathering. This is uh, the only possible approach for DX9 and it is the fastest approach on DX10, DX11. We could use uh, cal uh, calculate shaders for uh, scattered writes, but uh, since uh, atomic writes are not this fast and we we'll have to use uh, integer numbers instead of float numbers. Well, this this won't be very convenient, and this won't be just slower. So, uh, the next step is actually applying the lights. Uh, 
uh, for each cascade, we might them out separately. We accumulate them into the uh, special buffers uh, on, on top of each other. This way allows us to compose complex lighting and this also um, allows uh, you just to integrate it into, a, uh, into any deferred shading engine or just pretty easily. So what we do for every pixel on the screen, we just reconstruct its position and we reconstruct it normal too and we just look up the uh, volume using the pixel's position. Uh, the normal is used actually to, uh, to converge over the uh, half sphere of the half sphere uh, oriented uh, among the normal with the incoming light. So again, uh, pretty simple uh, number of lighting approach is used. So basically we converge uh, spherical, uh, we, we, we converge the cosine lobe oriented along the uh, normal with the with the amount of light flow in the current uh, in the current uh, light propagation volume itself. There is one pitfall uh, which actually the nature of our approach. We interpolate spherical harmonics li uh, linearly across the uh, volume, the propagation volume, uh, which is fine uh, most of the time, but which could, which could cause uh, some issues when there is, for example, uh, the wall with different light forms flows on different sides of, it, of this wall, uh, which can cause, for example, unwanted self-illumination or false lighting or false shadowing or all kind of those stuff. So what we do, uh, what we need to do, we have to detect those cases and to dampen, uh, dampen the lighting for those pixels. So what we do, we compare primary light propagation directions, uh, directions in the current cell and uh, in the cell, uh, in the next cell, uh, which is sampled uh, in the direction of the normal. Uh, what we do, project the gradient vector on the light mode direction vector and uh, we smooth step the, the result so that, so that we can uh, actually dampen the, uh, our, our lighting. So this heuristics means that um, if there are no obstacles between the two cells, uh, the direction, the main light and the direction vector should, uh, should point the same direction. And if those directions differ much, then it's highly possible there is an obstacle between those subs. Mm. And that's it. Uh, additionally, to diffuse lighting, we also try to simulate the spec specular lighting. We try to simulate the most reflections. So what we do, we actually do some uh, path tracing. So have a look at this picture. We trace our light propagation volume uh, along the reflection direction and we sample, sample several cells. Uh, we assume that, uh, we assume that the light coming from the light source, which would be substituted somewhere here, uh, it propagates uh, across the cells, uh, having uh, the same direction and the same uh, and the same uh, intensity or most intensity. So what we do, we calculate the spherical harmonics function value in the direction uh, opposite to the uh, reflection vector and we average this value across the several samples in the reflection direct, uh, taken uh, in the reflection direction. Uh, surprisingly, surprisingly, uh, due to uh, the low frequency nature of propagated light, this approximation uh, gives us pretty good results. 
Uh, I think this effect could be, uh, could be seen pretty well in our sponsor demo. Of course, uh, of course, following the same idea as used for uh, for usual lighting function, we uh, apply for number of functions too. Okay, so this is the sample screenshot. On the left, you can see the full lighting applied. Now, all together with uh, directional light and with textures. On the right, you see only uh, light propagation volume results. So you can clearly see uh, the reflection of the of the red uh, red tip pot on this uh, glossy and on this glossy surface. Okay, so what do we have at the end? Since our approach doesn't require any pre-computations and it is totally real-time, it allows to use any kind of dynamic objects. It allows to use destructible, destructible geometry and uh, all kind of those stuff. We also save on uh, streaming bandwidth. Of course, uh, if you've got an open world game, uh, you still have to utilize streaming but you don't have to stream light maps and any uh, pre-computed lighting. Uh, another benefit, obvious for everybody, and actually <laughs> I believe that on the project support, artists would, uh, well, they will be willing to pay a lot to get this. It's saving uh, artist iteration time. So uh, you truly uh, get what you see. In the level editor, you get it at the end in the in the in the game, so you don't have to wait for several hours or probably half a day to get your light in at the end. You can tune your lights in real time, and you immediately see uh, the results in the scene. Uh, one uh, another benefit is actually that quality is scalable. You can use bigger reflected shadow maps. You can use more light propagation volumes, you can use more lights. So you can see in our demos that in some places the number of lights uh, which actually influence the light propagation volumes it comes to hundreds and even more. And uh, you know due to the effect that uh, you can use lower resolution uh, reflective shadow maps on small lights, this allows you to bump the number of dynamic lights uh, even higher in fact, when we were working on the demo, on the, our ROG demo, um, initially we had uh, RSM generation attached only to the lights which cast shadows. So at some point, when I was playing with cache and I just enabled, forcefully enabled lighting, uh, RSM generation for every single light, even if it doesn't have shadow map, if it doesn't have anything attached to it, and surprisingly, surprisingly, uh, FPS was still high. So this approach actually allows you to attach a reflective shadow map to every single dynamic light you have in the scene. And moreover, you can also replace your static lights by the uh, RSM generated lights and it's still not be fast. Uh, as you've seen before, as Wolf's, uh, Wolfgang showed you before, uh, cache in your head for every light is it's really small. And if it becomes even smaller if you reduce the resolution. So uh, what are our next steps? We're still working on uh, increasing the quality of our algorithms. Uh, we also try to we're also going to move some parts of our algorithms uh, to pre-calculated uh, pre uh, part of the frame. So we're going to cache. We're not going to have any pre-processing uh, during baking time. Probably caching on demand or caching at startup. That is what we're talking to Matt. So thank you. Thank you for listening to our presentation 
and please, uh, I'm going to pass the word back to Wolfgang. So, hi. Uh, I will just go through the questions now and try to answer, try to answer them. So, let's start with the first question. Have you done anything in attempt to mitigate the cost of RSM generation from multiple light sources? Um, Yes, our, our caching scheme is, is kind of like the, the, the setup we use, and we will also extend this into more quality levels. Um, so this uh, caching where you can cache 15 kilobytes per uh, byte um, is, the, is the technique we use to actually make rendering into reflective shadow maps um, cheap. Uh, the next question is, what format is used for the CRSM. So what format do our uh, cubic reflective shadow maps use? We have um, 888 for color, uh, sorry, 888 for normal, 111110 for color, and 16 for 16 bit for depth. The next question is, do you think the effect would suffer much by using an RSM technique that requires fewer geometry passes, e, for example, dual paraboloid or tetrahedron mapping? Um, I looked into, when looking at shadow maps, um, the comparison between cube shadow maps and, and dual paraboloid shadow maps is always uh, close. The, in our level, uh, the level we used, uh, we don't have a very high geometry density. That means if you do a dual paraboloid projection, uh, it won't look that great. Um, you need lots of geometry in there to get this right, to, to get the projection into the half sphere right. Um, so we would have a, a quality problem with that. Um, but we haven't tried, really. 